Welcome to another edition of City Lights. And today we're going to be talking about single payer health care and why you should be involved and what you should care. Rally for Healthcare for Human Rights is the name of our show, and I'm Lisa Stiller, and we've got two really awesome guests. Jen, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Jennifer Loomis, a PhD candidate in sociology at Portland State and a healthcare activist. Dr. Gorman? And I'm Paul Gorman. I'm uh, from Physicians for a National Health Program. And Jen, why don't you start us off and tell us what's happening in Salem on February 4th? Okay. So Oregonians from all around the state are going to be gathering on the Capitol steps because it's the first day of the 2013 legislative session. So we're going to send the message to our legislators that health care is an issue that's important to us and we believe health care is a human right and we want them to support house bills that support single-payer health care and health care for all Oregonians. And it's very important we get lots of people there because there's lots of issues competing for attention of our legislators. So we want to let them know this is a priority for us. And then also there are opponents who have deep pockets and we all know money talks. So what can talk louder than money is thousands of Oregonians coming together and saying we believe health care is a human right. And later on in the show, we're going to tell you how no matter what part of Oregon you live in, you can come to Salem and help us spread the word. And Dr. Gorman, tell us what is happening in the legislature. We have a bill sitting there that's going to be introduced this session. Tell us a little bit about it. Well, so this bill was introduced in the previous session and you had a hearing, and now the bill's being reintroduced in the current session by Representative Michael Dembro. Uh, the bill uh, is the Affordable Health Care for All Oregonians Act, and it simply establishes that everyone who resides or works in Oregon will be able to get health care. Um, instead of having many insurance companies and all kinds of complexity and waste, there will be one publicly funded, privately delivered health plan for everybody that works in, or resides in Oregon. There will be no co-pays, no deductibles, and there will be a comprehensive package of benefits that includes things, all medically necessary services, including things like preventive care, mental health care, dental care, and those sorts of things. So just to reiterate some of the more um highlights of the bill, everyone's covered. Everyone's covered. And importantly, uh, no question, if you work in Oregon or you reside in Oregon, you've got health care. You don't have to worry about that anymore. M also important, you can see any doctor you want. You're not limited by the insurance company or some plan or any of that. The doctor you choose, the hospital you choose, that's where you can go. So you have choice and you have access to health care. Now, do you have to choose this plan or if you're covered at work, does that still help? Worker. Everyone will be covered under one plan. It's very important that we get everyone covered under one plan. The current system divides people into little groups. So this group's paying this and that group's paying that. And what ends up happening is the people who are the sickest and need the most care can't get it because they can't afford it. If we put all our money together in one common risk pool, it becomes affordable for everyone. So what happens to the insurance companies? Well, the insurance companies are going to find another way uh, to make a living. And it might be that some of the insurance companies will get into some kind of administrative function that will continue to be necessary. But currently, our insurance system wastes about $400 billion in the United States a year just in billing and paperwork. And that's enough money to pay for the health care of everybody who's uninsured. So it's, it's a question of if we covered everyone that's uninsured, all we have to do is go to a system that doesn't require all this wasteful paperwork. And from reading the bill, I think I read something about 12% is going to be for administrative administration costs, which is pretty low. 12% is lower than we're currently uh, spending in the U.S. by quite a, quite a large fraction. A little higher, though, I should mention that, for example, the Medicare system in the United States has administrative expenses that are less than 5%. So when you have a broad system like this with one set of rules, administrative costs are going to be less. And what people are going to also be wondering, I think you mentioned, is the funding. Quickly, in one or two sentences, what's the funding aspect? Well, the funding is pretty much the same as now. And I don't think all the details have been worked out yet. As to, But for the most part, it's going to be a combination of payroll taxes and employer payments and so forth, adjusted according to the capabilities of those and size of those companies and so forth. But the, it, it'll work a lot like Medicare does. And I think the key idea here is we won't be paying more into the system. We'll just be using the money more effectively so we can take care of more people. It's important to realize right now um, 45,000 people die every year in the United States because they don't have access to health care. Not because we can't figure out what's wrong with them. Not because what's wrong with them can't be treated. Simply because we don't let them in the door. In Oregon, that's 558 people every year. About 10 people a week die simply because they're not insured. 
This health care plan, by covering all Oregonians and making sure everyone can get the care they need, means that's going to end. So once this bill is in place, and hopefully it will be in place, all people need to do is sign up and they are automatically covered. Everyone's covered in the state, right. And then the choice you have to make is not whether to go to your doctor when you're sick or not. The choice is you get to decide which doctor. Right now, um, people who are insured, about one in three people who have insurance delay care or do without needed care because of the co-pays and deductibles. Under this system, there won't be co-pays and deductibles. You just go to the doctor, go to the nurse, midwife, go to whoever your care provider is and get the care that you need. One thing we've noticed in countries that do have um, universal health care, which is mostly industrialized Western world, the preventive aspects are much stronger. How will the prevention aspects in this bill help keep us healthier? Well, preventive services will be covered, and that's the most important thing. I think that one of the things that keeps people from getting preventive services, and prenatal care is a pretty good example of that, for uh, the, the majority of women who need prenatal care but don't get it, it's either because they don't have insurance coverage and can't, or they, they simply don't have access. And so once you make these services available to people in an economic way that they, can, they don't need copays and deductibles and so forth and insurance to get them, then those services become available. And those kinds of preventive services are very cost effective. And when you think of not getting prenatal care and the effects on the babies, and what happens, the money we spend on infants who are born because they didn't get prenatal care. So the U.S., um, uh, and this has to do with some of the things we were talking about earlier about what kind of society we want to be. Uh, the U.S., uh, in the most recent numbers I looked at, we're 44th in the world in maternal mortality. That means there's over 40 countries where it's safer to have a baby than the U.S. And we're in 30-some in, in infant mortality. So there's more than 30 countries in the world that, where it, children have a higher chance of survival at birth. And I think we have to ask ourselves, is that the country we want to be? Or do we want to be the best in the world in all of these health statistics that we do so badly in now? And one clear difference between us and all these modern industrialized nations is they cover everybody. We're the only modern nation that doesn't have universal access to health care. And there'll be no co-pays, prescriptions, no co-pays for prescriptions? Prescriptions are covered as well. Um, there'll be, there'll have to be some kind of adjudication. I think the, I think the bill has a some kind of board that will decide what's medically necessary and what's covered. And currently, actually, Oregon's been a leader in figuring out which medications uh, are the most effective and the most cost effective. We've had a plan in place for a long time trying to determine which are the kinds of drugs that, um, that are worth the dollars we're, we're paying for them. And Jen, let's go back to you because you're going to talk about the, some of the sociological implications of single payer. What are some ways our society is going to benefit as a whole if we enact universal health care? Sure. Well, you know, some people say a measure of our society is how we take care of the less fortunate among us. And currently in the United States, we ration care on the ability to pay. And this has been described as the cruelest form of rationing. And so, you know, public health and everybody being healthy is critical to a society and a community and an economy. And so, you know, by allowing people access to preventive care getting timely care and getting problems taken care of before they escalate and get more complicated and expensive to treat. We're allowing our neighbors and family members to be healthier, have an improved quality of life, which leads to happier and healthier communities. And also, you know, we hear all the time about decaying infrastructure and our schools need more money. And, you know, our government provides these services for us. But right now, because our healthcare system is costing us so much, our government is forced to spend a lot of money in this area to the neglect of other important social services that people need. And so by switching to this type of universal health care system where we're using money in a more effective manner, it'll allow other social services to be provided and it'll just allow people to have an improved quality of life, less morbidity, longer mortality, or longer lives. And uh, it's just, it makes a more livable area and a happier community. So I want to go back to that better quality of life. Let's talk about work and the work environment and economics. Sure, yeah, well right now, as many of you know, uh, we tie health insurance to employment. And this causes many people anxiety and stress. If they're unhappy in their job, they may stay there because they, they worry about losing their health insurance. And you know, maybe some people have always wanted to start a business, but they, they can't afford private insurance on the private market. So you know, by, allow, by 
having a universal health system that's not tied to employment where everybody has health care, it will free people to leave a job or a relationship they're unhappy with and it may allow people to start new businesses and small businesses won't have to worry about providing insurance for their employees because every Oregonian who works or resides here will have coverage. So, and it also, by allowing people to have timely access to care, we can reduce uh, days, sick days and days, work days lost to sickness, which just improves the productivity of the economy. That's a really important point you just brought up, that the, uh, a universal coverage plan is really small business friendly and entrepreneur friendly because all the people who'd like to go out and start their own business but can't, a person my age, I, could, I wouldn't dare lose my job and go out on my own without insurance. I, it'd be crazy. Uh, but with universal coverage, every person who's got an idea about a small business can go out and try that and see if it works and know that they'll be covered with health insurance if they get sick. One of the things that people bring up that they're concerned about is that if they're a small business, they're going to have to pay more taxes, they're not going to be able to pay their employees. How would you answer that? Uh, well, I don't know what the specifics will be of how this will be worked out in Oregon. What I do know is that uh, more than a dozen states have conducted studies of single-payer programs or universal health care programs, and there have been about a dozen federal studies, and every single study shows that it's economically beneficial. The state of Vermont, for example, recently had a study performed for them to look at the economic impact of a single-payer program versus several other programs, and the single-payer was the most economically beneficial to the state. Um, benefits like having, uh, it's going to attract more uh, more uh, employees, more businesses, um, and control costs. Uh, one of the points Jen was making, uh, when you look at the, um, uh, the current business environment right now, one of the commonest reasons for labor action is health care benefits. That's one of the things that's putting people on strike. When you look at municipalities and, and cities that are trying to cut their workforce, often they're cutting the workforce because they can't afford the health care benefits. So you have to ask yourself, how many more teachers could we hire? How many more policemen could we hire? How many more firemen could we have uh, if we didn't have these astronomical health care costs? So getting health care costs under control is key. And if the, one thing's been clear over the last couple of decades, it's that our current insurance system isn't controlling costs. In fact, the opposite's happening. So we think this universal, currently, this, this universal health care program that's been proposed in Oregon is a good way to get control over those costs. And I want to hit on education because we all know how important that is and how in Oregon we fight for the funding of education. How is universal health care going to actually help our students? How is it going to help our teachers? How is it going to help our quality of life is getting better educated people because they're going to school, because they're healthy? Well, sure, we know that different populations of people have different disease burdens, and the greatest burdens tend to fall to minority and low-income populations. And so this means that the kids from these populations are missing more days of school. And when they're missing school, you know, they're not getting the same education, and it leads to higher dropout rates. So by allowing timely and access timely access to care, kids can, you know, see the doctor when they have the cold or the ear infection and they're less likely to miss school days and more likely to participate in activities and sports and stay in school and also being healthier um, allows them to participate in more activities, graduate and go on to college. One of the things I noticed when I was looking at the statistics for who's insured and uninsured I think 580,000, 585,000 Oregonians are presently uninsured, and most of these are under 65. The really, really poor who get Medicaid were kind of lower numbers, but once they were um, they costed out of Medicaid, all of a sudden the numbers shot up of uninsured, the ones who are just above that level. I think it's important to understand. Um, we talk about the uninsured as if it's some segment of the population. The uninsured is us. Uh, the people that I see in the free clinic where I volunteer sometimes, um, it's just everyday people. Um, the husband lost his job or the wife lost their job. Uh, they run out of insurance, then they run out of their medicines, and a couple months later they're both sick and they show up in the clinic. The uninsured are us. Uh, one in six Oregonians is not uninsured, but in any given year, one in four Oregonians goes without insurance. And when I sit with a room of medical students, nursing students, doctors, any kind of group, and I say, who's ever gone without, been uninsured for a period of time? Virtually every hand in the room goes up. So I think it's important for us to realize everybody 
Uh, we're all one illness away from being uninsured and going bankrupt. If you get a serious illness, none of us could possibly save enough money uh, to afford what health care can cost in today's environment. I think so. So everyone's at risk for this. And, and uh, the other thing about the uninsured, just to, we, we have some misunderstandings about that. Eighty percent of people who are not insured have jobs. Most of them are young adults with kids. Uh, there's uh, a very large fraction of the uninsured are children. So when we're thinking about who the uninsured are, it's really the average American. It's typical people who got laid off, whose, uh, whose job ended, who are um, in that difficult period between uh, um, they're not yet eligible for Medicare, and so they're wait, you know, 55-year-old, 58-year-old, 61-year-old. They'd like to retire. They're sick. They have chronic diseases, but they don't qualify yet for Medicare. That's who we're talking about. And that's the other population where there was a spike. There was a bit, there was a spike in numbers of uninsured, and especially I want to relate that to the unemployment problem. What's happening with uninsured? You know, uninsured and being unemployed. Jen, do you want to talk a little bit about the effects of the recession and insurance, what's happening with medical care? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so every year up until the last year, the number of uninsured has increased. And the reason for the drop in the last year was a change uh, implemented by the Affordable Care Act, where young adults age 26 and under um, were able to stay on their parents' health insurance. And this was the reason for the drop. But essentially, every year, um, more and more Americans are uninsured. And also, underinsurance is becoming a greater problem, where more costs and more risks are shifted to the patient. And more often, too, we're hearing the rhetoric of patients being referred to as consumers, consumers in the medical marketplace who need to manage their money wisely. But we all know that costs are not advertised clearly, and it's difficult to compare health plans, compare services. So, so yes, we're seeing growing problems with underinsurance and uninsured, and these people tend to have very difficult time getting access to care and the emergency room is not a viable option because there the doctors are only required to return them to a stable condition and also every time you go to the emergency room you're likely to see a different doctor there's no continuity of care so being uninsured really is has been linked to a higher probability of death and that is essentially what it comes down to when people don't have insurance they're more likely to die, and by not implementing programs like this, we're essentially sanctioning that. Glad you brought that up because um, uh, there's still people who we. It's possible to get terrific medical care in this country. There are some people get fabulous medical care, and certainly we have places that can give better medical care than any place in the world. But across the country, we don't have the best health care system in the world. And, um, and, and for all the variety of reasons, there's no continuity. People are forced to go to the emergency room. They can't get primary care when they need it. They can't get care before they're so sick they need to be hospitalized. Any doctor or nurse you talk to can tell you stories of someone who got way sicker than they needed to be and could only come in uh, late in the game when they needed hospitalization and far more expensive and, and difficult treatment uh, because they couldn't get care when they needed it. So we have kind of a two-tiered or three-tiered system in this country. You know, there's the uninsured to get nothing, so we get some care than the ones who have all the good insurance, the money to get the best care. And how is this going to even all this out? Well, there isn't, there isn't a reason why everyone in the country can't get that good care. As I mentioned before, we currently waste uh, about $400 billion a year in the United States on paperwork. When you compare uh, administrative costs, the dollars that a hospital spends in billing, in the billing department in the U.S. to what's spent in Canada, for example, Canada just has one system. They're a lot like the, the program that we're talking about here publicly funded but privately delivered health care. And the, the hospitals and doctors in Canada don't have to waste all kinds of money submitting bills and claims to insurance companies. They just submit a claim and it's paid and that's the end of it. And that $400 billion is enough to pay for the care that the rest of us need. All this stuff about we need to ration and cut down on what people are getting and we need to cut back and all that stuff, it, it, we really don't even have to, need to have that conversation if we could save so much money on administrative waste. And that's one really important thing was the, what's covered. Everything is covered, right? There, is there well, I think that medically necessary services are covered. I'm sure there will be some things that people want that won't be covered, but medically necessary services will be covered. 
And again, when you compare the U.S. to all these countries that cover everyone at half the cost, by the way, the U.S. spends twice as much as the average cost for most nations, and yet we get worse outcomes. But when you look at surveys of people in places like Canada, Australia, the United Kingdom, there's no way they would give up their health system. Sure, they have, there's this wrong with it or that wrong with it. They, of course, they all have some problems. But no one would trade what they have for the United States system I because they have security. One thing that, that is a big argument, look, what, look what's happening in Canada, look at the problems in England, but does that necessarily mean that we're going to have the same system? Or are we going to have a system that will work for us? I think we'd have a uniquely American system, but the, 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 the key here is we're not talking about a government health care system. We're talking about publicly funded health care, but privately delivered. That's, so that's the same doctors, point. the same hospitals, the same health care providers that are out there now would continue to be providing health care. People they just have their choice of health care provider. They, have, they exactly. still have their choice. They that was a big concern so with paperwork. the Obama's bill, was people were really thinking the government's going to tell them where to go and who to go to, and that's a big concern. So I want to emphasize right. that for that's a bit. A, that's right, and that's a myth. That's a myth created by people who opposed uh, the act. I think that what no one's talking about a government health care system. We're talking about publicly funded, privately delivered. One last question before we get to some of the specifics of the rally is yeah. the feasibility of this. People sa say this sounds wonderful on paper. You guys sound great. Can we really do it? So I would like to say that, um, you know, this this country has tried to enact national health insurance five times. and. People believe that they've failed because they've come in a top-down fashion. But the successful passage of Medicare and Medicaid, they succeeded and happened because of grassroots support. And it takes both a willing leadership and vocal grassroots support to make something happen. And that's why we're pushing so hard to spread the message to all Oregonians to get them to speak up and to educate themselves and read some books or articles. We'll give you good websites to go to, pnhp.org and hcao.org. Mm -hmm. so, um, so grassroots is key, and, um, and Paul can talk more about that. I'm sure we could do it. Yeah. One more quick thing I want to cover, and then we're going to have to get into rally specifics because I know people really want to go now, and they really yeah. want to support this. There's some people say, let's let the Affordable Care Act go into effect. Let's give it some time. Right. Do we well, have the time to do that? I think the Affordable Care Act is a great step forward. Um, as Jen mentioned, there are people uh, up, students up to the age of 26 can now be covered on their parents' plan. That's a lot of people that are covered. Preventive services are covered now. They're required to be covered. That's a wonderful thing. Uh, people who have pre-existing conditions have to be able to get insurance. That's a wonderful thing. But the Affordable Care Act does not do much about, does really think really about controlling costs. And so the cost spiral continues. And even with the Affordable Care Act, under the best assumptions, there's still 25 million people <coughs> with no insurance. That means there's still 20,000 people a year dying who don't need to die. So I think the ACA is a good step forward, but we know we need to do better. And the bill that uh, Representative Dembro is going to introduce is the kind of thing we need to do. I want to emphasize that with the ACA that one of the differences with universal health care is there will be no co-pays, there will be no premiums to pay. Great point. The ACA doesn't do anything about the fact that co-pays and deductibles are keeping people from getting health care, and health care costs are driving people bankrupt. Uh, medical expenses are one of the most are the most important cause of bankruptcies in the United States, and most of those people that go bankrupt had insurance when they got sick. And since the ACA has been enacted, premiums have been going up 10, 15, 25 percent in some cases. If you earn over 400 percent of the poverty level with the ACA, you're going to be paying over $800 a month in a premium. So there's a cost still there. Yeah. Let's get to the rally. Now we have people all wanting to come to the rally. Give us a few more details, Jen, and how people can find out more and get involved. Sure. Well, this rally is being put on by Healthcare for All Oregon, which is a coalition group of more than 60 organizations representing diverse Oregonians. And uh, it's going to um, start at 9.30 a.m. with a sign-in. So we'll be doing a sign-in 9.30 to 10.30. And then, weather permitting, there will be a march from 10.30 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. 
And the rally with speakers and musics will actually start at 11.30 a.m. on the Capitol steps. And this is at um, 900 Court Street in Northeast Salem. So um, after that, we'll do lunch and there'll be an opportunity to speak with representatives and do some lobbying. So um, yeah, and if you live in the Portland area, um, we will be having some buses leaving. And I'll tell you where they're leaving from. Uh, it's the Unity of Portland Church at 4525 Southeast Stark, and you can get there via bus lines 15 and 20. And um, we also have some carpools, and there's a way you can sign up for these buses and carpools. If you go to um, the Jobs of Justice Portland webpage, which is jwjpdx.org, on the left side, there's the Healthcare is a Human Right Rally. And uh, once you click on that, you can see the links to uh, sign up for buses and carpools leaving Portland. And they'll be leaving at 8.30 a.m. to get down to Salem. And you've been seeing websites flash on the screen. That's the website I think you're seeing. So that's the one that you go to. And all the information's up there. We're really excited about this rally on the 4th of February on, in Salem. I think uh, another point that I think is worth making is there's a very large number of people who believe single payer, this kind of plan, is the right answer. I can't tell you how many doctors, political leaders, et cetera, I've heard say, you know, I think that's the right answer, but it's not feasible. And if there's one thing that would make them know it's feasible, it's thousands of people standing on the Capitol steps saying, we're behind this bill. So I think we can all play a role in getting this thing to happen by showing up in Salem or supporting the process in any way that we can. And if can. you live in another part of the state and you're watching this, there'll be buses from different parts of the state. Go to the HCAO website and you can find out how to get a bus and transportation. Especially important for people from all around Oregon to be there. Yeah, and we're also asking everyone to wear red bring rain gear just in case, and also pack a lunch. And if people can't go or after they go, or what else can they do to get involved? If they find they're in work, at school, or if they go and then they come home and they want to do more, what more can people do? Well, I'm glad you asked. Um, so visiting these websites is a great start because there's lots of resources on there and, uh, and links to other sites and studies and reports that have been done and books so that you can read up. You don't have to take our word for this and you can learn about the issues. Also, uh, letting your representative know that you want them to address this issue and you believe healthcare is a human right. And also you can volunteer and get involved with Healthcare for All Oregon by ha hosting a house party and letting your friends know, maybe showing a movie or just having a discussion about these issues and letting your friends and family or maybe your faith group members, let them know that there's this movement going on and, and that this is something important to you. And they can always go on the Oregon Legislature website and find their representative and they can always write to them. Yes. We have just a little more time left, so I want to repeat some of those values we talked about. Jen, give me a couple of good values out there that really support single payer. Absolutely. Um, universality is one of them. Everybody has health care. Also, uh, transparency. We know what's going on. We see exactly what's covered. You know how much things cost. And the public good. This is something that's important to community health, and it's something everybody benefits when your community members are healthy. And Dr. Gorman, 10 seconds, anything uh, else? Jen, uh, Jen just brought up an interesting additional point, which is transparency and accountability. And under our current system, there really isn't any transparency or accountability for what's going on in healthcare. On a, under a publicly funded, privately delivered system, we'd have both of those properties and we'd have a very people-driven system. And we're putting people before profits. Exactly. Hey, thank you for watching. I'm Lisa Stiller and you've been watching City Lights and come to the rally on February 4th.